Welcome to another issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. My special guest this week is Andy Matushak. Andy, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners and watchers? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I'm a researcher. I'm focused on designing user interfaces that can augment human intelligence. That's really great. And you live in San Francisco? I do. Yeah, yeah. Near, nearby. It's a gorgeous yeah. day today. Um, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about your independent research later on. Um, yeah, sure. So um, you have some tools for us. What's what's a favorite one of your tools? For sure. Yeah, yeah, I thought it might be fun to start with a tool that I told you about when we were spending some time together this summer, but uh, I couldn't actually physically show you just because of where we were. Um, and, and that is this very unusual um, e-ink monitor. So th this is an external display. Um, and uh, I, I have right now preview.app and um, uh, uh, my text editor open side by side. And it's, it's just Mac OS X. So like the whole, you know, the, the OS is here. Wait, 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 when you say the OS is here, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so what I mean by that is that um, often, you know, this kind of tool, we have a Kindle or we have a, a Remarkable or something like that. Um, and there are these, these really great like special purpose devices. Like one of the things that's nice about a Kindle is that it doesn't have like all your software on it. Uh, sometimes right. that's, that's kind of what you want. Um, but one of my favorite things is uh, working outside. And so here in San Francisco, if we have a beautiful sunny day and I want to go sit in the park and read a paper, like uh, here I've, I've got, you know, this, this complicated paper uh, and I'm maybe writing some notes. Uh, the, the notes I have up don't relate to this paper, but no, normally I'd be reading the paper and writing some notes. Okay. Um, and I just I want, want a keyboard. To to take a moment to describe what it is that we're seeing. Yes, yeah, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> so um, we have, it looks like something like a small, tiny, flat screen, but it's only maybe, I don't know, 18 inches. It's 13 most. inches. 13 inches. Um, yeah. And you have up there some text, like a, it looks like a PDF maybe. Um, yeah. And you, you say this is e-ink, meaning that it's... Um, it's reflective. It's not, there's not a light behind it. Is that Yeah, right? this is an e-ink display. We're looking at an academic paper. Uh, and uh, next to it, we're looking at uh, my text editor of choice for the Mac, which is Bear. And uh, uh, it is, because it's an e-ink display, I can work outside uh, with, with impunity uh, uh, without squinting my eyes, just like right. you, you would read a Kindle at the beach. Um, right. And uh, the, I guess the difference with the Kindle or the Remarkable that, that I really enjoy is that if I'm doing serious knowledge work, which I, I do attempt to do outside <laughs> sometimes, but it's, but it's beautiful, um, you know, I, I really want uh, a keyboard and uh, uh, all of my notes, and, and I, I want to write potentially thousands of words, mm -hmm. and I want to follow references in the paper. Mm -hmm. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm really startled at the performance of this thing. So I'm going to attempt to, to type and to allow you to see me typing. Right. Um, it's going to be a little difficult because of how I have this set up. Okay. Um, can you still see the screen? Yeah, but right now, um, the, your little monitor there is tethered or plugged into Correct. your laptop or something. So it's not a self-contained unit like a Kindle or Remarkable. Is that's that right? right. And and that's actually something I really like about it. Um so right now it's kind of standing on this ridiculous little stand, uh -huh. uh, uh, but it, it weighs um, it weighs something like eight ounces. I, I don't recall the exact weight. It weighs very little, and it's quite thin. Um, and so the usual way that that I use it, yeah, I can't show you my laptop yeah. very easily because I'm using the laptop for video. Right. Is um, I actually just sit it on the hinge of the laptop, um, okay. and it just like sits in front of my normal screen. Uh, and then I have the, the keyboard and trackpad like usual. So it's like I have this super powerful, you know, Apple laptop. It's like just the computer I want, um, except its screen is like superimposed with this ink display uh, so that I can work outside. Right. Okay. So it's like it's like you made your own version of an Apple laptop that had an e-ink display instead of, a, you know, LED or LLP. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Like like a really uh, a really grungy modified right, laptop. Right, right. It stays on the hinge just fine, uh, and um, it, the power consumption is is very low because it's e ink. Right, um, right. And so actually, the battery life is longer uh, when I'm using this right. display. And and uh, just again to, to to verify, it looks like it's just black and white, like a lot of e inks. It's oh yeah, yeah. Color e ink is still. Uh, 
it, it, it exists, right. um, but it is uh, very slow to refresh. Um, but the last time I checked, it was multiple seconds, and it was used for like bus advertisements kind right, of thing. Right. So I saw when I was in China oh, almost maybe three years ago or more, I saw f- uh, screens, monitors that were yeah. on very flexible uh, films. Yeah. They were, they were in full color. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, were, were they, were, they were LCD screens? I, I don't know exactly what it was, but one of the things they were saying is that they were actually um, – they could actually mold them into different shapes. It wouldn't just have to be flat. But um, oh. so I'm wondering, I'm wondering why, um, I mean, wh- like what's the difference between an e-ink and one of these flexible film screens in color right yeah. now? Yeah, I think I can explain that. Maybe okay. it's it, the, 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 the technology of ink is, is not my specialty, but let me give it a shot. So um, I, I would guess that the flexible you screens can, you that can, you saw. come around and um, we'll, see, we'll see your face in full. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe let me let me quickly uh, show for those who are watching on video just the typing performance. Okay, so you yeah. can see what it is like to type. Um, it's it's really fairly reasonable, uh, which which I found really quite surprising. Like writing thousands of words is is kind of fine. Um, so so but, it, it's it's changing in real time like any other kind of a monitor would. Yes, but very much unlike a, a Kindle. Which you know normally you're like a second to to move to the next page or something like that. Okay. Um, so uh, let me try to answer your question from a moment yeah. ago. Um, so the the way that Yank displays work is is kind of strange. Um, they there's a film that that has these uh, tiny little bubbles of uh, like ferrous material, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I gather that. Um, when the bubbles are like closed or wrapped around the material, then light passes around them or through them, something like this. Uh, and then when a voltage is passed through, the, the bubbles can be released and maybe they, they block light. Uh, and and uh, in this way, you, you have a, something that is kind of like a piece of paper, like it doesn't emit light, it reflects light, except where those, those bubbles have, um, I guess, made, made this, right, this, right, right. this uh, black material. Whereas the, the, the flexible screen you saw, I would guess, is... is um, like a traditional thin film transistor where you have these, these plastic crystals that, that rotate uh, into a, an opaque and um, non-opaque configuration in front of um, some kind of a light source. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess like the, the light source can be tiled to make it flexible maybe, mm-hmm. uh, like, a, like a strip of LED lights. I'm not exactly sure they did it. Um, mm-hmm. I do know that the, the actual film of the ink display uh, is flexible. There's this great photo uh, at the Media Lab, which is where e-ink was developed, right. of someone with like a huge roll of, of e-ink film that they'd fabricated and kind of like unrolling it down towards the Charles River. Uh, and, you know, this kind of this undulating <laughs> roll of this very expensive film uh, on, on the grass and the ground. So I, I gather that it's it's kind of the other components around the display that, that make it rigid. I, I don't know of any flexible e-ink. Right, right. Uh, so, so, so for you, the, the, the benefit of this cool tool of the larger e-ink monitor, just a display, is yeah. that it's just a superior display, particularly for outside. But it seems like you yeah. also are using it inside as well. Is, what right. are the advantages for using it inside? <clears throat> yeah, let me caveat. So it's actually inferior in almost every way. I mean, <laughs> uh, like it, it, this, this display is really bad. Like uh, uh, there, there's ghosting. Um, it's not only is it black and white, it's actually only 16 shades of like uh, black. Right. Yeah. Um, it's like kind of fuzzy. So it's, it, it's a bad display. Um, the only reason you use it really is to be able to use it in the direct sunlight. Now there is kind of a secondary reason. I do still pull it out inside sometimes. Um, if I'm feeling kind of like hyper stimulated, I'm kind of like bouncing off the walls or whatever. Um, the vibe of an ink display is very, uh, calming and slow by comparison to the vibe of a like 60 frames a second like super super fast uh emissive emissive light display Mm -hmm. Um, so it feels a little bit more like sitting with my notebook and writing by hand Mm -hmm. it's not quite as deliberative as that Mm -hmm. um that is usually the better solution but sometimes i'm like actually trying to work on a manuscript and uh i really do do need the manuscript (laughs) and have you looked at the new kindle scribe 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, it, that would be kind of a head-to-head competitor with something like the, the Remarkable that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and uh, it, it seems to have r- roughly a similar feature set. It's, you know, it's maybe not as, quite as extensible. It's maybe slightly higher quality in some ways. But the main thing that that class of devices misses for me is um, if I'm doing serious reading, like I'm writing while I read, and uh, none of those devices really affords that. Well, the scribe does handwriting, but it doesn't do keyboard. Uh, yeah, it, it's not serious. It, I mean, n- the, the handwriting stuff, n- none of it is really, you know, it's like you can pop open a little, like, a little couple inch by couple inch space to scribble in. You can make, like, a whole page of handwritten notes if you want, but you can't, like, look at the text while you're <laughs> looking at the page of notes. You know, the workflow for, like, doing anything with any of that stuff is meager on all of those devices. Uh, so I have a Remarkable. I, I actually, I use it a lot when I um, when I travel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but writing on any of those devices is not good. Okay. All right. Well, th- and, that, and again, the name of that monitor, just in case someone does want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Called what? Sure. Um, th- this is the uh, Dasung <laughs> Paper-like. Um, okay. And it is... Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's bad in every way, except for the one I described. Um, p- some people like, there's an alternative that uses the same ink panel, so it's going to have the same core problems. Some people like the Onyx Mira. Um, both of them are phenomenally expensive. I mean, it, it's really, it's, it's silly. Uh, but I like being outside. And, you know, if you can have a dozen great days outside a year, uh, right. it's a fine thing, uh, I think. Sure. <laughs> okay, so the Dawson Paper White, or Paper Paper Light. Light. Yeah. Like paper, like like it's paper, like a piece like. of paper. <laughs> okay, it's like paper. All right. Um, okay. Well, that's great. Uh, so, um, how about uh, a second tool that that yeah, yeah. would be loath to lose? Yeah, you've you've got it. Okay. So, um, this one was a, a collaboration with my wife. Some collaborative problem solving. So, Kevin, as as you've seen, and as um, people who are watching on video can see, but I will describe for those in audio. I live in a small San Francisco home. This is like eight hundred square feet. And uh, so, so space is at a premium. And, um, you know, I don't have that much wall space. So uh, what you'll see here is like, I have a lot of a lot of windows and like windows are a good use of the wall. And um, all other wall space pretty much needs to be bookshelves. Uh, that's, that's the designated use of wall space. Uh, but, uh, you know, th- this creates a problem, which is that um, I have a tiny office. It's you know, maybe 15 square feet by 15 square feet. Also, it is my bedroom. Uh, so uh, viewers are seeing my office slash bedroom. And uh, you, you'll, you'll notice like this wall, of course, behind me also has to be used for a bookshelf because otherwise, what would we do? Yeah. Uh, what, what I lack in all of this is whiteboard space. Mm. Um, space to stand and write, especially to stand and write with other people. That, that's what a whiteboard is particularly great at. Um, and I think this is a common issue for people in, in small spaces with, with relatively few walls. Um, and, and so um, an insight I, I had that I was kind of excited about is that if in any of your spaces you have a door that is usually closed, uh, then the reverse surface of that door is an excellent candidate for a whiteboard surface. Um, because uh, one of the important properties of a, of a whiteboard for me um, is that you be able to leave material up over time. Mm. Um, so when I first thought about putting a whiteboard here, this is my office slash bedroom. Uh, and it's like my bedroom that I share with my wife. And so like having like my work stuff in, in our bedroom, like that, it's not, I, mean, I don't want to leave stuff up, even if we had room for it. Yeah. Uh, and we also don't have room for it. So the idea is that uh, uh, putting it on the reverse surface of a door, here I, I have a pocket door, um, allows me to uh, leave material on a whiteboard up over time uh, and also kind of fabricate some more wall space. Um, over in this direction, I have like another door, uh, which if it, if it opened the other direction, the back of it would also be a good candidate uh, right. for a persistent whiteboard surface. Uh, so I will quickly demonstrate the whiteboard in a one-handed fashion. Um, This is a 3M film, uh, which is quite affordable um, and uh, uh, is is, is easy to cut. You can cut it to arbitrary size. Um, It it has adhesive. uh, And um, this is several years old now. And uh, I was worried that it it would get like really bad ghosting and and, um, that it would be difficult to to erase it when I was done with stuff. But it's actually fine. Uh, It's been totally great. 
So the three M film is made for white birds, or is it a film yeah. made for something else? It's like a dry erase. I'm sorry. It's actually manufactured by the Post. Well, I guess Post It is a three M brand. It is a Post It yeah. brand uh, whiteboard film. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, I know that there was uh, a lot of people used, um, a th- if you were putting up on a wall, a thicker um, version, it was shower uh, shower stalls from Home Depot. Yeah, yeah, like mel- melamine kind of stuff, yeah. or, or ideally even porcelain. Um, right. Absolutely. You know, uh, if, if we had the clearance with with our door, I think yeah. that would be an even better thing to do Right. Uh, to, for, for, for your hidden whiteboard. <laughs> right. um, did you ever consider just uh, drawing on your glass windows? Yeah, I did. Um, the, the, the trouble with drawing on the glass windows is, uh, well, you can see that uh, my, my desk is kind of in the way, yeah, <laughs> or rather true. viewers can see yeah, that yeah. my desk is in the way. Uh, and also that the contrast ratio um, is is really pretty poor. Right. Um, and then the final issue um, is the, the leaving stuff up over time issue. Like, I really do want to be able to uh, leave stuff there for, uh-huh. you know, weeks potentially, um, but not have it be obtrusive. And my home is small yeah, enough that yeah, really awesome. uh, I guess any awesome. window... <laughs> There would also be kind of a confidentiality or a privacy issue as well. Oh, there could be. Yeah, there could be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't care about that, but certainly others might care about that. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I, I'm not able to see. Do you, do you have whiteboards in, in your space, Kevin? I do. Yes. I have a whole wall. Yeah. I yeah, have, you, you, you have a, 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 a large, uh, spacious office, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a wall with eight foot high um, that, that, that are both porcelain and magnetic. So oh, that's um, great. So yeah, I, I'm a big advocate. In fact, I have a smaller one right here that I don't use as much. I thought mm-hmm. I would I would use one right next to me, but I'm I, I rarely use it for whiteboarding. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big advocate of uh, particularly with for me the thematics because I can put up books in progress, put up the pages, of course, of course, that kind of stuff instead of having a cork board. It, it, yeah. And mine actually is um, middle, it's a light gray. Oh, interesting. Because the white, when you have a whole wall, is very bright. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah, I can totally see that. So I have, uh, it comes in a light gray, which is perfectly adequate for um, lettering and at the same time, a little bit easier on the eyes. That sounds great. Now, I don't have a good solution for pinning a bunch of stuff up, and it really bothers me. Yeah. Well, you could put a sheet of metal under your um, film on the back of the door. Yeah, you know, if if I got it thin enough, I, I could probably make that happen. Yeah, um, that, that's a that's a that's a good point. I've got maybe another sixteenth inch of a clearance there. <laughs> right. it might be some some thin sheet, galvanized sheet that you might be able to get there, which would be enough yeah. for. Yeah. 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 Right. And and then I have to, I guess, be, I mean, I think the thing that stopped me is not so much the metal, but um, how to attach stuff to it in a way that the door can still slide. Yeah. And I guess there's those really flat neodymium magnets that might work. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Keeping the magnet on there. Yeah, that's an issue. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, well, um, uh, that is that is interesting. You could maybe make a thinner door. <laughs> <laughs> you're right yeah yeah i could fabricate a thinner door that's a good point uh, uh honestly i kind of hate those doors anyway so maybe it's a good excuse to just yeah, yeah. <laughs> use a piece of plywood that's a little thinner and gives you enough for your magnets um, yeah good work well, out for a but anyway i think your point andy about uh white bordering is there's something about standing up and thinking that's different than when you're sitting and yeah. having a conversation with your full body when you're standing near whiteboard is very important, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and likewise, sitting in, sitting in a park and thinking uh, right. with the same book is totally right. different. Right. Yeah. And walking while you're thinking, as we know, is very, very important as well. So, um, so anyway, so, so it's a great idea of using this 3M whiteboard film as a way to make instant whiteboards in places like say the back of a door or other um places um that's really cool so so that's a great idea thanks and 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 i guess uh it comes on a roll with some at some width is that right the the three yeah inches? yeah it's like a six foot by four foot roll you can cut it okay. um you, you want to like cut it kind of carefully and and let me also before i forget give give credit for uh thinking of the pocket door application of this idea to my wife okay uh, you've met <laughs> great that is a great idea okay yes. andy so tell us about your third um tool 
Alrighty. So um, I really like cooking. And um, Kevin, I, I have no doubt that you are familiar with kind of the, the sous vide kind of family of, of cooking techniques. You vacuum pack stuff and, and you put it in immersion circulators. But I was really excited to discover um, a new kind of home cook accessible addition to that family um, that only became uh, accessible relatively recently when a bunch of Chinese OEMs started to make these really cheap. Uh, it's always a beautiful thing when that happens. Uh, yeah. And that's a chamber vacuums. The idea is that yeah, so um, we might we might need to just review with the sous vide <laughs> sure. for those who aren't as familiar with it. But I will do that. Yeah, the, the, my understanding of the general premise is that you are cooking something at, at, at low temperatures for a long time, very consistently, and partly the way that you are able to do that is there the food is packed in a vacuum plastic bag which enables it to have full contact thermal contact with the solution and yet not take out the juices it's sort of segregated in that way so it can cook its own yep. juice that's that's all right or or, or in a flavorful liquid of, of your right. choosing um and and you don't um dilute uh, so for instance if you poach something in a flavorful liquid then you usually need like a quart or something of flavorful liquid and and now uh, you're diluting the, the flavor a lot um, and uh, it, it also, it doesn't necessarily need to be for a long time. Uh, it's really more about temperature control. So um, with English peas, for instance, uh, they're really lo lovely at um, uh, 70 degrees Celsius to 18 minutes. Uh, but it's like pretty difficult on a stove to like cook something at 70 degrees Celsius for 18 minutes. Right. Um, so the chamber vacuum is kind of the first part of that, that process, or, or, or a vacuum is the first part of that process. If you're doing something simple, um, like cooking a chicken breast, you actually don't need a vacuum. Um, uh, the, the concerns that, that you mentioned about you know making sure things are really well exposed, it's not really a big deal. You can use a Ziploc bag and just try to get the air out, uh, and it's kind of it's kind of fine. Um, when you start doing things at higher temperatures with vegetables and and fruits and sauces and stuff, um, small amounts of air expand, and, and then it becomes very difficult uh, to, to get thermal contact. Likewise, if you are cooking something for a long time, you really want to get the air out or else there can be oxidation or bacterial problems. So previously, the way that home cooks have had to do this is with um, a family of devices that was like the food saver. And so these were devices which were called um, their edge sealing vacuums. Um, so you have a vacuum pump and um, it, it looks almost like one of those um, feed document scanners you might have on your desk. I, I actually don't have one to show you. Uh, um, it's kind of a s small and narrow, and uh, this is a vacuum bag. Uh, I'm holding a vacuum bag uh, for, for those listening audio. The vacuum bag is, is open on one side and closed on three. I have a piece of apple in it. And so with, with these old style sealers, you'd have um, a wide, narrow device, and you'd kind of put the, the mouth of the bag into the wide, narrow device. It would suck out the air, and then it would use a, um, a uh, uh, an edge sealer that's like a heat uh, heat wire uh, to, to seal the plastic. Um, and, and, and that's economical and uh, works kind of fine. Um, the, the, the trouble is that you have um, atmospheric pressure on the outside um, and then like quite negative pressure um, over here. And so for instance, if you have a liquid in the bag, like something flavorful you want to infuse, um, then you have to be very, very careful uh, because as, you're, as, you, uh, as you vacuum out the air from the bag, the liquid uh, uh, will will rise towards the ceiling uh, of the bag because there's atmospheric pressure around it and there's only uh, negative pressure or, or low pressure around the, the lip of the bag. Uh, and so um, it will tend to come out <laughs> for one thing and, and, and screw up your seal. Um, uh, and it's also very difficult to get the last bits of air out. So th there's, there's two kind of interesting advantages to this, this other kind of vacuum sealer, which recently became something that a home cook could afford. They, they used to cost thousands of dollars and, and now they're like a couple hundred dollars. Um, it's called a chamber vacuum sealer. Um, and the, uh, the distinction, can, can you see this object? It's yeah. a black cubic object uh, for those listening on audio. It looks like, a, it looks like a, distinction... a printer or a fax machine. Size. Yeah, it kind of looks almost like a, like a 3D printer, like it has a thing I open, uh, yeah. and you like you know, put something inside of a, a chamber. Um, and, and this thing works just like the thing I described a moment ago, except that um, both the inside and the outside are going to be at uh, very oh, low pressure, rather okay. than just having the edge. Uh, and so um, and that thing is now making some noise. And one thing that's kind of fun is that as it pumps down the vacuum, of course, we don't see any change in uh, what the bag actually looks like because the, the, the air is pumped out at the same rate uh, from the inside and the outside. So it, it doesn't actually collapse until the very end when we re-expose to atmosphere. Um, 
So, so this is kind of the first thing they can do. It's not that exciting. It's very, very good at getting all the air out of the bag. So if you want to, um, you know, preserve stuff for a long time and, and, you know, be sure that it's going to last a year in your freezers or years in your freezer, this works really well. Um, it just finished and I'm going to show you what it looks like. Um, it's like super clung to this apple. <laughs> wow. Well, and so it looks like it, uh, it times itself and then <clears throat> seals itself automatically. That's right. Yeah, it does. And you can interrupt it, you know, if you want to change stuff. But I thought you might be excited about maybe the, 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 a second thing it can do that I, I'm really excited about, uh, uh, which is um, marination and compression. Uh, this was my real motivation for getting this thing. So here I have some apple that's kind of thinly sliced, and I have um, a little marinade that I might use if I wanted to serve this in a salad. It's just like apple cider vinegar and salt, a little sugar. And if I put these thin slices of, of apple into this marinade and then put the whole thing into the machine, so I have a few slices in this marinade here. I'm going to put the whole thing into the machine. It's not in a vacuum bag. It's just in this container. Oh. Um, then now an interesting thing is going to happen, and th this will take something like 40 seconds, so I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'll show you what's yeah, happening. Yeah. Um, uh, when we apply the, the very low pressure, um, there's a lot of little pockets of air in the apple. Uh, that's part of what makes apples crisp. And so all that air will rush out, uh, and the apple will get uh, denser. Um, and uh, so if we did nothing else, the apple gets this kind of like very... Um, intense flavor, uh, relatively speaking, because it's, it's kind of uh, stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, also like a like a almost a meaty texture, just relatively speaking. But because it's in a liquid, uh, when, when the air gets forced out, uh, the most natural thing to happen is, is for the liquid to substitute in for those little air pockets. Um, and so it's a way that you can really quickly uh, marinate and infuse uh, things mm -hmm. and, and produce textures that, that, are, that are difficult to produce in, in other ways. Wow, wow. So I heard the... Uh... The timer go off. Yeah, yeah. There's it does it does two cycles, and, and I'll show, and when the second cycle finishes, which will be a few more seconds, okay. I'll show you the side by side. You you can see actually it visibly looks quite quite different. And wh one of the main ways that I, I use this day to day actually is, is pickling. Um, you know, often it's it's a weeknight, and I'm like making dinner, and I, I realize that I really want uh, uh, some pickle to serve on my salad, and I like I, you know I don't have time to let it sit overnight to really absorb the flavors. Um, so like, you know, here's some, some pickled red onion that, uh, I, I made just, uh, on the spot. Uh, and it, it's like totally pink all the way through with its, its marinade. Uh, and, and that uh, was no, done, no that was done within a matter of a minute. It was the machine. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I, I will show you now, um, the distinctions. Um, okay. Now, I don't know how well this will come through the, uh, the video. So but, you have two uh, slices. One slice is a little darker than the other. And a, one of them. A, yeah. Yeah, it, it may not be all that visible. Uh, in, the, in the room, it's actually quite visible. The one that was in the machine is kind of translucent. Uh, it, it's it's uh, by, by, by comparison, I can see straight through it. Uh, I was hoping it would take on the color of the liquid. It probably wasn't as strongly colored enough for that. But um, the, the flavor is intense. Um, which is lovely. Uh huh. And that's and, and that's it, it. Wasn't that much smaller? So what, the flavor is intense because it absorbs from the marinade. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So the, I should have clarified the two pieces I was holding up. One I hadn't put in the marinade. Right. And the other I had. Um. And and so uh, it's it soaked up marinade in you know a span of a minute and a half or whatever sure, that was. Sure. That's really fantastic. And and these are and this is called a chamber vacuum. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to an edge vacuum. Uh huh. And the one that you are recommending, or is is an Avid Armor? Is does the um, brand make much difference these days? Is there a lot of variety? I don't think it does. You know, when, when I dug into this, it looked to me like there were a couple of OEM <laughs> that that just kind of like made these things, and some yeah. people kind of slapped some logos on them. Uh, so I, I think it's it's pretty interchangeable. The big difference um, that that listeners who are interested. Uh, would want to think about is is really just the size of the chamber um, that there's uh, some very nonlinear relationship as the chamber gets bigger you need a much stronger vacuum um, and of course like a bigger chamber is uh, very desirable as a cook uh, you right. want to be able to like put a you know, like a roast in there or something uh, so that's your main trade-off 
So there, there is uh, within my uh, maker community, there is the use of v vacuum chamber pots for um, doing castings with resin. Right. So I'm just wondering if um, um, there's pressure pots where you increase the pressure and then there's vacuum chambers right. where you make a vacuum to release bubbles, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I wonder if it could also double as that if you weren't as squeamish about um, interchanging your resin in your food. Yeah, I think that would be fine. You know, cooks actually use chamber vacuums uh, for exactly that reason. Some of the, the very elaborate cookbooks I have will have a step in the recipe that will be like, you know, after you have pureed these things together, so you've made this interesting sauce, um, take that sauce, put it in the chamber vacuum, run a cycle, um, because the clarity of the sauce is impacted probably for the same reason as the model making by the little bubbles. Right, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, and so about how much you say there's a couple hundred dollars for, for, for these? Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're often like deals and stuff. I think I got this one for like $280. I, I, I don't know what the MSRP is. All righty. That's a great new tool. I had no idea about. That's really fabulous. Thank you for introducing. Oh, cool! I hope it can help your model making. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, making a pressure pot. What we um, everybody does, not everybody, is you buy a cheap Harbor Freight air air um, paint uh, pressure pot and convert it into just a. It's used for, actually it was made to 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 do a spray paint for homes, but you can modify it to make into a pressure pot for doing resin casts. What about so, for vacuum? Um, for vacuum, uh, I, I don't know. Um, it's a little different, but um, so let's see. How about your your third, um, or, or excuse me, your fourth um, um, tool? What, was, what, what, what do you have for us? Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> this one, I guess, relates to, to, my, to my research, and I'm, I'm going to uh, I guess talk about some, some things that I'm not really doing with my research, but which I, I think are like pretty interesting to do with some of the same, uh, some of the same concepts. So uh, Kevin, I know, I know you're familiar with this concept of spaced repetition. So, so I hope you'll forgive me as, as I briefly explain it uh, for those listeners who are not. Um, just, just the idea, um, this is very commonly used in language learning. So we'll begin with that scope that, um, if you would like to learn, uh, say a large set of foreign vocabulary, um, a very good way to do that is to, you know, make a bunch of flashcards uh, uh, representing those words, and then uh, to study them initially right after you make them, and then perhaps a couple of days later, and then assuming all is going well, perhaps uh, four or five days after that, and then perhaps 10 days after that, and then you can kind of continue expanding, maybe a month after that. And so it's a very startlingly efficient way to um, rapidly internalize a large amount of information. Uh, and part of what's what's interesting from uh, kind of a technology perspective is that uh, you can improve this process a great deal if, if you make the whole thing dynamic so that if there's, say, a couple of words that you're having trouble with, that um, the, the, the schedule um, is tightened so that you spend more time on them and, and, and we make sure that you spend most of your time studying the things that you're having trouble with. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about that if we have time when we talk about my research. Um, but I wanted to talk about some unusual ways to use these systems. Um, because I think it's, it's underappreciated and, and uh, it's something that's really important in, in my life. So the, the digital versions of these kind of flashcard systems I, I just described, one way to think about them is that they allow you to take a very large pile of small tasks, where in the case of language learning, the task is try to remember this word, and um, to orchestrate those small tasks in batches, which you can actually do uh, in, say, a five minute or 10 minute period that you might have set aside for this. So in my life, this is part of, you know, like I, I do exercise, I do meditate, I, I play the piano, and I set aside five to 10 minutes for um, these, these little micro tasks. Um, and what's fun about them is that they don't have to be things like remembering vocabulary words. So I just wanted to give some examples of like unusual things you can do with these systems to orchestrate attention uh, on very small tasks where um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to pay the cost to orchestrate the attention on the task uh, as an individual object. Uh, but but in, in this kind of bulk fashion, it starts to be really useful. Does that make sense as a, as a tee up? Yeah, it does. So, so what's an example? 
Yeah, great. Okay, so so the kind of the first step uh, into weirdness um, is just to do uh, more interesting cognitive tasks than recalling. Um, so, so those of, of you listeners who are who are into cognitive psychology or learning science might be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, which suggests that uh, uh, there are kind of more complex ways of understanding uh, information from remembering to to applying to analyzing, evaluating, and, and generating or creating. And so you can create small tasks that are, uh, for instance, um, improvise a short melody in the minor pentatonic scale. Uh, that is a, a good example of like a, a creation task or um, an, uh, an, an application task that would be kind of cognitive um, would be like apply the lens of deontology to a recent decision if you're trying to kind of understand what deontology is and internalize it in your life. This isn't really about memory. This is now about kind of like putting this to use and like bringing it into your world and connecting it to stuff that you care about um, on some kind of a schedule. So of course these systems will have a schedule built in <laughs> that's kind of built for, well, generally language learning. Uh, and you know, it has certain rates uh, and, and, and kind of effects when you say like, I remembered this or I didn't remember that, it'll change the timing. Um, accordingly. And so you kind of have to subvert that. And you say like, nope, like, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kind of control the timing for this. And these buttons that say like remembered and forgotten, what they really mean is like, I want to see this little task more often or less often. Uh, and so if a task is really useful, or is uh, maybe really fruitful or something, like maybe you want to see it more. Uh, and you can do that. Um, but, but let me like veer into some weirder stuff. Uh, if that's so, cool. So but just let me then, go for it. Go for so it. I can clarify. It. So it the space repetition that for me the the interesting part of that was the spacing part uh yeah yeah and that was a dynamic spacing based on your performance yeah. in the last round but you're saying yes. you're kind of like you're throwing away that part <laughs> of it and, and we're just going to do micro scheduling really and not really be concerned about the the space no no the dynamic spacing is still essential so so like uh sorry i, I think I, I didn't frame that very well let me, let me try again so say that you're trying to you're trying to internalize what the minor pentatonic scale is um you want to like spend a little bit of time on that over the coming months uh and probably like less and less time on it as it becomes more familiar and maybe you it's don't ever skill, want to it's stop a skill, it's a skill that you are actually trying to acquire and become good at yeah all right okay. yeah so, so Likewise, that's we're thinking about deontology. Right, okay. So it's not just like an occasional interruption or a kind of interesting exercise to flex your minds, but you're actually trying to acquire some kind of skill, but it's just not a memory yeah. skill. That's right, that's right, yeah. Uh, and and the, the dynamic feedback stuff is still really useful. I guess what I'm saying is like, whatever curve it has built in uh, is like not necessarily the curve that's appropriate. And so, so you may have to kind of push it around a little bit to get the, the, the thing you intend. But you do still want to like probably have it space out more and more. Mm -hmm. um, so some like weirder examples that I really enjoy um, are things like a visualization exercise. So uh, if, if I've done like a really intense hike, uh, a thing I love to do is to take a photo uh, at the end of the hike uh, and then to have the prompt be, um, visualize uh, you're sitting on that hill uh, at the end of the hike, just bring yourself back there, you know, and I'll like take a deep breath, uh, I'll take a moment, I'll bring myself there, I'll remember how I felt, uh, I'll remember, you know, how hard it was, if I, if I went with friends, I'll maybe remember that stuff, uh, and I'll kind of picture what, what I was seeing as I sat on that hill, uh, and then maybe I'll use, you know, the back of the flashcard to actually show me the, the image. And again, mm -hmm. it's not really about like, trying to remember in the sense of like memorizing it's it's more like savoring right but you are trying to get better at it which is why you want to keep repeating it maybe it's not clear to me that i'm trying to get better it, I, I it's like i want to keep repeating it because it's meaningful and it makes my life better to put myself back in that place and to um feel those feelings and to uh it, like it makes me happy um but also there's some um, tolerance or something like that. Like if I did it every day, I, I, I'd get bored and it, it wouldn't work. So, you know, I, I have kind of a stack of these and effectively the sp what the spacing does is it biases the stack towards, you know, relatively more recent stuff. It tries to make me not get tired of these scenarios. Mm. Uh, uh, and, you know, and eventually I see them less and less, but they maybe never totally go away. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 
Yeah, I mean, maybe in the beginning you do it once a month and then five years, 10 years from now, you're doing it once a year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or even less frequently. I think they want, you know, much sparser uh, mm -hmm. things than, than language. But I have a whole bunch of stuff like this. Uh, here, here's another one that's kind of negative. Exposing myself to thoughts that I flinch away from. Mm. So like, you know, I had an experience at Khan Academy where like a project failed because I knew that Stal, like the, the head of Khan Academy, he opposed it from the start. Uh, but he like, he didn't want to come out and say it. And I just kind of like let that sit there instead of addressing it. Uh, and I like, I don't like that. That's why the project failed. Like, that doesn't feel good. I don't like to think about that. Uh -huh. uh, but like throwing that kind of thing uh, in the system is great. For like, okay, you know, put myself right back there. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. let's think about that again. Let's feel that. Like, let's feel how I felt when I realized that's what was happening. Uh, and let's think like, is anything that's going on right now like that? Like, let's let's take a moment to actually think about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, checking in on that, like kind of um, almost making good, of, um, making those lessons uh, a little more valuable. Right. So in the language realm, there are off the shelf apps, you know, like, um, uh, it was Ak Akika, um, Akita? Anki, is, is Anki, Anki and is. others. Are you using those same kinds of apps, but repurposing them? Yeah, so I mean, because this is related to my research, like I have my own thing, but I used Anki for this for years before I made my own thing, and it, it's fine. I mean, like Anki has, you know, there's lots of things people complain about. Uh, it's it's ugly and hard to use and whatever, but like it's fine. Um, is so there, I, is if anyone better, listening to this is is there a better one to use? No, not, not really. You know, I mean, I would recommend starting with Anki. Whether whether you're going to use it for language or not, just use Anki. I think that's probably right. Um, if if you're a Windows user, you might consider Super Memo, um, mm -hmm. which is, is is commercial and is is um, has a, a bunch of really interesting stuff. But um, I, I'm not a Windows user, so um, I, I don't. And um, I, ha I have like a big list of this kind of like weird stuff <laughs> you can do with these systems. I, I have like dozens of these things, and uh, and so you can find the, the link in the, in the show notes, I guess. Okay. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And then just kind of as a summary, so this is an uh, an app that would be used to um, help you um, grow in certain cognitive functions other than just mem memory, but in other things besides memory as well. Yeah, I think of it as, as a kind of, it's a kind of personal growth practice like meditation. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of catechism. It's like an environment for catechism uh, where, where you're kind of authoring those things. Well, is there some repetition involved, but it's, yeah, space. Yeah. Well, that's really great. Okay, well, thank you. So, um, so Andy, um, with our remaining minutes, why don't you tell us about um, either some of your recent work or recent projects, something you're passionate about that you want to share? Okay, so, I mean, we talked about spaced repetition systems. I just wanted to show maybe a little bit of, like, what I'm doing with them. Um, you know, you mentioned that, that people... Uh, people will make, like, decks of flashcards for language learning that other people can download. Uh, and that seems to like work pretty well for language learning and for kind of um, simple facts, like for instance, anatomy, uh, medical students like to, to use decks for that. Um, it, it appears not to work very well for um, arbitrary conceptual knowledge. Uh, so a, a lot of people have tried making, you know, like here's, here's your deck on like uh, statistical thermodynamics uh, or whatever. Like, can we use that to deeply internalize statistical thermodynamics? And, and, and the empirical answer has broadly been no. Um, and, and so um, I, I've been working on a system uh, with, with my, my colleague, Michael Nielsen, uh, to try to solve that. Uh, our, our theory is that the, the problem with these, these kind of conceptual decks of flashcards um, is that they, uh, they're kind of too isolated. You have these little cards, and they're not really related to anything. Um, so you can't build the connections you need to really understand stuff. So the idea is uh, books are really good at building uh, kind of a, a rich connected network. Uh, you read a narrative, the author is doing all this work uh, in the narrative and in the structure of the book to really make something make sense. Um, now you still have to work with the concept um, and you might forget the concept. So you need to do something to like internalize it more deeply, but at least like while you're reading, you, you have some sense of how things are connected. So the theory is that, well, what if, like, while you're reading, we, we interpose these, these kinds of questions? You say that you can introduce these questions. You mean there's a question that you, that who, who, who's, where are the questions coming from? 
Yeah, let, let me let me describe for for those who are listening, like what, what we're looking at here. So, so I, I'm 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 showing Kevin um, a, a textbook on modern statistical techniques, and I was kind of scrolling through. So it kind of looks like a normal textbook. Uh, it does normal textbook things. Uh, and, and then after we read a section, we reached um, a little box where the author has set aside uh, some uh, some little practice for us. Uh, we can check our understanding. We can see whether we've internalized concepts from the text. We can apply what we've learned a little bit. Uh, and so in this sense, you know, it's not so different from um, the kind of questions that you'd find in the problem section in a textbook. Um, that part is, is pretty familiar. Uh, sorry, my trackpad is very unhappy here for some reason. Um, so we can kind of go through and see, you know, do we remember what sort of values null distributions describe? Okay, they're, they're, they're about... The sample statistics for the null hypothesis, maybe we forgot that. We can kind of work through this. And the thing that's really material here relative to an existing kind of textbook is not the interactive thing that, that you know, uh, we get this, this feedback while we're reading the book. I, I think that's not really what's important. Um, I, I think what's much more important is that uh, all of these things are kind of like saved to your, your collection uh, as, as you read through the book. And so, um, there's there's this system that I've I've developed uh, ca called Orbit that um, as as you read through these these books where authors have prepared this kind of material, um, you carry the book with you and uh, kind of maintain your connection with it over time by working with that knowledge by by answering little questions like this, doing little tasks in the following weeks and months, and it has the kind of dynamic behavior we were alluding to before, where if you're having trouble with something like uh, if you if you if you can't actually uh, think what what this sampling distribution would describe the, the question that we're looking at, um, then uh, uh, you'll you'll work with that kind of question more often. Okay, so so um, so, so um, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. So so you're saying yeah. this is a textbook. This is a digital textbook. It's not on paper. It is, and yeah, it yeah. has these little problem uh, problems, uh, practice problems, and then if you know the answer, it will tell you it's correct. If you don't and then you can be shown the answer or whatever. Is the idea that that then this is a textbook that you don't leave, you just kind of keep returning to the textbook on a regular basis, reviewing the material? Yeah. It's like a constant perpetual... Um, the, the idea is that these very questions um, are, are being kind of added to the, to your collection for your, your your maybe your morning catechism that we were, we were talking about earlier. If you're going to set aside five minutes for personal growth using this sort of uh, strange system where you're doing little tasks... You're going to see these questions in that system, and they'll cycle into rotation according to how well you seem to be able to perform with them. And uh, they they make it very easy to get back to the the source context, so okay. that you can bring yourself right back to the book. Right. So let's say you you you're in the morning, and presumably this is a mixture. You would have all the questions, whatever. Maybe yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. There, there's actually some interesting the kind of science suggesting it's 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 better actually to to mix all the topics together. Right. Right. So, so you have one on, you know, what's the Chinese word for marble? There's another one on, uh, you know, what's what's a, a derivative in calculus. And then, so you have all these things. And then if you want to, or does it automatically, if you don't get something correct, does it show you that the portion of the textbook where you that's discussed yeah yeah or is this that is a good question so so uh it, it's it's optional right now the, the question of like what intervention is actually yeah. appropriate is is a really interesting question uh underexplored okay so the idea though is that you have kind of ongoing review of what you're trying to learn in, in the largest scope of all the things that you're trying to learn and you yeah. have you have your kind of um taking a part of your day to spend on that learning. And that's right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's only a few minutes. Really. Sure. Right. Okay. That's great. And so, um, Thanks. is this something that's available for people to try? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's a research project. So, um, uh, yes, uh, there, there's a version of this that people can try. That's called quantum country. Um, and I think it's that was not in the list of links. country. Yeah, yeah, like like a place you could visit. Okay, um, it's a uh, it's a textbook on quantum computation that has these ideas oh, right. integrated into it. So it's and, it's, uh, it's just about one subject, which is quantum computation. I see. That's right. Yeah, and I, I've been I've been 
working on a, a bunch of other <laughs> texts right. that, that have revealed a bunch of interesting things about what happens when you try to make this work with different subjects. Right. I've always heard that you don't ever really understand quantum. You just, you kind of get used to it. So I, it's, it's that a, is part of the that's motivation. A yeah. brave <laughs> one to start with because there's kind that of, is part like, of the motivation. <laughs> Um, it's like if, if this works, if it really helps, like that's that's uh, where you want it. <laughs> okay. Um, alrighty. So, um, um, that's really great. So, Quantum Country. If if we'll have a link for that, if people want to try it out or maybe help Thanks. you search it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I, I suppose I should mention if people want to help. I, I, I'm an independent uh, researcher. I, I'm crowdfunded uh, through through Kevin's uh, something like Kevin's 1,000 True Fans model. So if you like any of that uh -huh. stuff, you, you can you can join the crowd. <laughs> so so just take one more moment to talk about that. So so is yeah. that your sole support is the um, crowdfunding, or do you also have some other affiliations? Yeah, I, I mean, at, at, uh, recently I, I got. Uh, a grant that is going to help me support hiring some staff, but uh, for, for for my personal income, yeah, it's my sole support. Uh, I'm I'm married uh, and uh, my wife works, so uh, uh, that that helps. But right. um, I I managed to to pay the bills uh, th thankfully, and and I'm grateful for that. And in general, the kinds of things that you're researching, I know you said at the beginning, but maybe just remind people broadly um, what is it that that you research. Yeah, yeah. I, I, ideas for augmenting human intelligence. Augmenting human intelligence. So when I think of that, I think of AI. Sure. Is that part of it? Yeah. Uh, well, I've certainly uh, I've done a number of experiments uh, with, with AI. My, uh, I guess, like my interest is augmenting human intelligence. My methods are usually something a little closer to cybernetics. So I, I would be inclined. I, I, my stance is usually making systems where you're working with the computer rather than uh, outsourcing to the computer. But mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the the space repetition algorithm is a, is a kind of very dumb AI, and uh, right. uh, uh, much more interesting ones, uh, of course, are, are available for other intellectual tasks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's really fantastic. So, um, if people want to find out more about you, besides your quantum country, is there a website or something that you have or yeah yeah andymatushak.org will have uh uh much much endless writing and, and lots more details okay. well andy thank you again these are really great tools i didn't know anything about i'm so delighted that oh, great. you okay. your attention and taking time from your schedule to share them with us so um thanks again thanks for the opportunity kevin okay we are glad that you enjoyed this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Just want to remind you that we have some other coolish material on our YouTube channel here. Please subscribe, comment, like. In addition, um, this Cool Tools Show and Tell is also available in an Audible podcast form. You can subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to other podcasts if you just wanted to listen. And if you're listening, know that there is a visual version of this on our YouTube channel where we're actually showing the tools and um, there's a little bit more of a visual component there. In addition, the same folks that put us, uh, the Cool Tools website out, we also put out a free newsletter every week. It's very, very short. It's one page or less. We recommend six very brief items um, that are very succinct, easy to read. You can deal with it in a couple minutes. And every week we bring to you the six cool things that we have uncovered and want to share. And it's called Recommendo with one M, recommendo.com. You'll be able to find it there. It's free. Join 50,000 plus other subscribers every Sunday morning. You'll get it in your email box. And it's actually one of the most popular things that we produce. But we do produce other newsletters as well. One of them is called What's in Your Bag. We have one that goes out to um, tools and tips for your workshop. So you can get those at our website, um, and they are also free. And finally, um, I want to mention the fact that um, we do have a Patreon, and um, this uh, podcast and this vidcast are supported by Patreon supporters. The minimum is a dollar a month. And for that, you get um, an email 
to ask us anything. We will respond and um, answer your question if we're able to. There are other higher levels. You can all see those at our Patreon page. And all those links are below right here. So thank you again for being a fan. And um, we'll keep producing stuff if you enjoy it. Thanks. We give thanks to this week's patrons who include Dan Dow, Bruce Bear, Shiraz Sherwani, Ed O'Brien, Mary Esther Brooks, Dan Spakowitz, Maureen Grolnick, Pillabeen, Santiago Uribe, and Kevin Sill. Thank you all for your support. <laughs>